we're now going to focus on what some of the key design goals were and are for C++, especially as it evolved over the years. As I mentioned before, the material here is more giving you the big picture view of C++. So if you're getting impatient to see code, don't worry, we will get to code. But uh, I want to show the, the concepts first, and then we'll gradually ease our way into C++ code. So as with C, which is kind of one of the key starting points for C++, not the only starting point, but one of the key starting points, runtime efficiency, both in terms of time and space, is crucially, crucially important. That's honestly why people continue to use C++ to the extent that they're continuing to use it, is because it allows you to be programming these lightweight abstractions that make it easier to write the software, easier to make humans productive without throwing performance out the window. So one of the key themes in C++ is this whole concept of zero overhead abstraction and zero overhead principle. If you look at the link at the bottom of the page and you click on it, it'll take you to a YouTube session interview with Bjorn Strustrup, the inventor of C++, talking about what zero overhead principle and zero overhead abstractions are. And, and some simple examples of this would be classes with constructors and destructors, inheritance, which is done in a very optimized way, generic programming, which is done in a super duper optimized way, uh, the various functional programming techniques that are added to C++, things like Lambda functions and so on. And by and large, these abstractions have little or no overhead whatsoever relative to writing the code in C, which is kind of the baseline for efficiency if you want to compare and contrast time and space uh, improvements with programming languages. So zero overhead abstraction and the zero overhead principle, really important in C++. Another key theme, which is related to this, is the whole concept of direct mapping to the hardware. So C++ doesn't require any virtual machine for instructions. It doesn't interpret things. It uses native data types. And so as a result, it's very, very close to the, to the wire, very close to the hardware, which means that you get to get the benefits of abstraction with almost no or zero cost. So same kind of theme. It's another concept, another way of saying zero overhead abstraction is direct to the hardware. Now, there are versions of C++ that have so-called managed extensions, but those are managed extensions. They're not actually part of C++, the standard. Some other things that are related to this, they don't require complicated runtime libraries, manage environments, environments or virtual machines, unlike other languages. So other languages like Ada or Java, for example, they have much more complicated runtime environments. Now, the good news is those environments are getting faster. People are doing better compilers, just ahead, just in time compilers, way ahead of time compilers. Hardware is getting faster. People are coming up with better ways to, to implement languages like Java to be super fast, but they're still not likely to be as fast as C++ just because it's so close to the metal. Now, having said that, there are some other things that these more uh, abstracted languages have as a benefit that until recently C++ didn't. And in particular, languages like Java have exceptionally good support for multi-processor and multi-core optimizations. And so there's things in Java like parallel streams, for example, or reactive streams that are very easy to optimize. And even though the nano level optimizations aren't there in terms of running on the hardware directly, the abstractions that map onto multi-core processors are such that you can usually get a big speed up relative to writing things in a single threaded uh, program. Fortunately, as we'll see later, C++ is now starting to catch up, and C++17 has introduced concepts of parallel STL containers, which give you some of the same types of benefits you would get with Java parallel streams in terms of being able to transparently take advantage of multi-core processors. The problem is that we don't have a lot of implementations of those things yet, but it's coming down the road, and I, I would certainly expect in the near future that C++ will again be very competitive or perhaps even better than uh, other languages in terms of performance on multi-core processors from a standards point of view. Some other things you don't find in C++ that you do find in other languages like, like Java especially 
is um, there's no language support, no built-in support in the language for persistence, for garbage collection, for networking, and so on. Um, and that's deliberate. They're trying to keep the language relatively lean and mean. There is now support for threading, synchronization, and parallelism. So starting in C++ 11, as you can see here, they added support for threads. They added support for some synchronizers like mutexes and condition variables and so on. With C++ 14, they added reader-writer locks. And then with C++ 17, they added support for parallel STL containers. Again, those haven't, the later stuff hasn't quite percolated out yet to all the popular compilers, but I think things are on their way. And so that will happen. But notice that these enhancements by and large have been added as library features, not as core changes to the language itself. There's no built-in thread in, uh, in C++. There's no built-in synchronizer the way that there is, say, in Java. In Java, the built-in synchronizers are actually part of the language specification that they added other stuff in the libraries later, but synchronization was built in from day one into the language. C++ is not like that. There are many, many libraries that exist that provide these kinds of capabilities, however. So if you want third-party libraries, you can take a look at, at Boost, which I mentioned before. You can take a look at Ace, which is something I wrote a long time ago, back uh, about 30 years ago. Again, it's hard to believe how long that was. And those fill in some of the gaps that don't exist in the standard library. And that, again, is, is perfectly understandable and by design. Some other things that were part of the original C++ design approach was trying to ensure as much compatibility as possible with C and traditional development tools. And so I, I like this diagram because it kind of shows you this concept. So this shows you a ship, it was obviously a steam ship that also had sails, right? So we're trying to maintain uh, compatibility with the past while we're moving into the future. And uh, one thing that you can do with C++ is if you have C libraries, then the layout of structs in C++ is equivalent to the layout of structs in C. So if you have C libraries, you can incorporate them into C++ very easily. It's an apples to apples thing. And because of these, because of this emphasis on backwards compatibility, all the existing system call libraries that are all written in C, on Windows and Unix and ANSI C and so on are all available out of the box and you can encapsulate them in C++ classes. That's kind of what ACE did. And you can do that in a way that again, doesn't require rewriting anything. Now, this is also supported in modern languages too. For example, Java has the Java native interface, but it's really convenient to do it with C++ because we're kind of at the same level of, of layout and call call conventions and method uh, parameter passing conventions and so on between C++ and C. C++ also works with the Make family of recompilation build tools. So Make has been around for eons. It was developed by a guy named Stu Feldman at at t or it's actually, yeah, at t Bell Labs decades and decades ago, probably like 40 some years ago, if not more. And Make is how you can ensure that you're object code and your source code stay in sync as you make changes to the source code. Nowadays, when you take a look at CLion, you'll see that they incorporate something else called CMake, which basically pulls in a bunch of dependencies, much like you would do with Maven or Gradle in the Java world. And then it goes ahead and creates a make file that you can use to build your program. And that's all kind of handled under the hood for you by your CLion environment. And I'll show you that here in just a bit. So as I mentioned before, you know, again, a long time ago when C++ was coming along, the idea was to be as close to C as possible, but no closer. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that C++ is actually not a proper superset of C. There are certain aspects of C that the C++ designers decided were just so bollocked up that they wouldn't support them, even though it might break some existing code. And I think that was absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, if you take a look at this link, you can read about this philosophy and how it guided the early years, sort of the, the 80s era time frame of C++. So here's just a few examples. These are some of the few code examples we'll have in the introductory slides that show you some code that's valid C, 
but not valid C++. So for example, in C, you can convert from void pointers to int pointers without a, an explicit cast. You can also use method calls like malloc to allocate memory without an explicit cast. And uh, in C++, you have to put casts in. <laughs> so you'd have to explicitly cast a void pointer to an int pointer. You'd have to explicitly cast the return value of malloc to, uh, to an int star in order for this code to compile. However, C++ really doesn't want you to do that, and I don't, I don't blame them because even that's error prone. Uh, we like to say, in real life, you use casts when something is broken. If you, if you break your arm or you break your leg, you wear a cast. So think about casting and, and associate brokenness with it. So in C++, they prefer you, you use newer style casts, which are able to look at the information in a more effective way, like reinterpret cast, for example, is preferred over the old style C style cast. And of course, as we'll see later, when you allocate memory in C++, you, you really don't want to use malloc for sure. That's, that's a horrible abomination. You probably want to use new, and even better yet, you don't want to allocate memory directly ever. <laughs> and so we'll talk later when we get into the C++ standard template library. There's a whole bunch of new factory methods and, and various convenience holder classes that get around having to allocate memory with new pretty much ever. And, and that's a great thing because using operator new and its corresponding sibling delete manually is just asking for trouble. So we'll, we'll come up, I'll show you lots of patterns and idioms to avoid using new. You'll also notice some other interesting things here, by the way, is the use of the word auto, the keyword auto. And that basically tells the compiler, you figure out how to deduce the type. And I'll talk about that when we get a little further along. In practice, the fact that C++ is not a proper sub subset of C, or superset of C, doesn't really matter. Very, very, very few people these days start with C programs. So I'm just mentioning this as kind of historical perspective on what was important you know, 40 years ago, but nowadays is not really that big of a deal. So if the early goal of C++ was to be as close to C but no closer, what are the later goals of C++? Well, the things that have been preoccupying the language designers over the past, say, 20 years or so, has largely been on improving support for generic programming, both in the language as well as in the standard library and the standard template library, as well as helping developers use the newer modern C++ features most effectively. So generic programming is a technique that generalizes software components so they can easily be reused in many different situations. So core concept is reuse and principle of least surprise and plug and play, mix and match, and all those good things. And if you want a nice overview of generic programming, take a look at the link at the bottom of the page, which is from the Boost website. Boost is this cool proving ground for black belts in C++ to test out and test drive new classes and new class libraries and new frameworks and so on. And they kind of give you an overview of what generic programming is. And it's, it's really where C++ is these days. One of the cool things with generic programming is you can use C++ classes, template classes rather, and C++ template functions in order to be able to write generic code that doesn't sacrifice efficiency. And we're going to talk a lot, lot, lot more about this later, but here's just a little teaser to whet your appetite. So over here on the right-hand side, I show you the typical implementation of the C++ STL algorithm copy, which takes a pair of input iterators, one pointing to the beginning of a collection, one pointing one past the end of that collection. And then it takes what's called an output iterator, which is where we're going to put the results. And what this is going to do, as the code shows, is it's going to go from the beginning to the end, copying the contents in the input iterator first into the results output iterator, and then incrementing the pointers every step along the way. And when we're all done, we will have copied all the elements from the input range to the output range, and we return the output iterator as the return value so we can chain things together. So that's what the copy algorithm does. And we're going to look at this a lot, lot, lot more later. Down below, I show you two very small examples that demonstrate how you can use 
the copy algorithm, both on C++ standard container types, like in this case a vector, as well as use it for native types, like an array of int. So you can see I make myself an array of integers from one to n. I make myself a vector of int from one to n. And notice how they, they both have the same initializer syntax. One is a, is a class defined as part of the C++ standard template library vector. The other is built into the compiler. And then I can use the copy algorithm to do exactly the same thing for built-in native types as well as types defined in either the standard template library or your own user-defined types that conform to the iterator rules of STL. And this is really cool because it means we don't have to distinguish between built-in types and standard types or user-defined types. In contrast, other languages like, say, Java have two different type systems. They have a type system that works for native types like int and double, and then they have another type system that works for either class library or user-defined types. And that's very confusing. And uh, I can't tell you how many times when I switched from doing predominantly C++ development to Java development that I wished I could get the cool, powerful template features in Java that I can get in C++. So these are kind of where the world's going with C++. They're also spending a lot of time, as I mentioned before, trying to document best practices for how to use modern C++ features effectively. And if you take a look at the link here, they have this thing called the C++ core guidelines. And these really try to codify best practices that guru black belt level C++ programmers have learned over the years, often for the school of hard knocks that they can pass along to us to be better at writing our code. And uh, here is just a very, whoops, a very simple example of one of these guidelines which I wholeheartedly subscribe to. It says, avoid calling new and delete explicitly. And the reason for that is that new and delete just gonna get you into trouble. You are much, much better off using other alternatives like the make unique factory method, which we will look at later, or using STL containers like vector and so on, so that you don't have to be responsible for managing the life cycle of dynamically allocated objects yourself. What a nightmare. Um, it's really fun to browse around through these guidelines. I think you get a lot. I could probably teach an entire class on nothing but looking at the guidelines. And maybe if we have some time at the end, we'll, we'll spend some time doing that. So you can think of these guidelines as basically C++-centric patterns, or what we call idioms, for how to use modern features effectively. So that's the end of our discussion about C++ design goals.